don't forget, we have a little recap on um, all of, well, probably you're watching on YouTube, but uh, we do a little recap each week. So this was last week's, and if you missed last week's products, you can always catch up because we have a lot going on. Um, well, this is, you know, videos that we put together. But this week we have some new stuff. Okay, we've got some edge lighting LED strip. This is just uh, warm white and cool white LEDs. Um, this is the warm white that we're showing here. This one looks so warm. Um, it's just plain 12 volts, you know, plug it in and it's like ultra high density LEDs and it looks like just one large, you know, warm uh, strip of light. We've had these before that the like the light comes out the front. These come the light comes out the side. Uh, so you can see only the top edge is lit. So this would be good for edging something. Like if you want yeah. to have a thin layer of light go around something architectural or a project where it you know, has to go around yeah. corners. Um, this way the light will go. Well, that's warm. What if I wanted cool? We have cool oh. too. So cool light. Again, we have the version where the light comes out the front. Um, and that's good yeah, for like high resolution. But the edge lighting, edge lighting is also very, very useful. Especially Absolutely. again, you want to bend it around because it's flexible. You want to bend it around. Oh, my cool side cold and my warm side warm. Got yeah, both warm and cool. And then next week we'll have uh, RGB um, as well. But just as a, a note, um, it's all one LED, like one big light. You as you power it, the whole thing lights up. It's not addressable. You can't animate the individual pixel. All or nothing. One ginormous led that you drive 12 volts okay uh next up uh yet another raspberry pi camera this week it's the global shutter camera so this is kind of interesting i guess this is used in photography instead of scanning through the pixels to take a photo like most um high uh resolution cameras do this is a global shutter which means that it it grabs all the pixels at once so that means that, um, you know, some people know if you try and take photos of something that's going very fast, you're trying to take speed photography, sports photography, um, some wildlife or nature, or whatever, something's moving very fast, you'll get like a skewing effect. Like if you take a photo of a propeller, you know, it's a common thing that you'll see that as the scan lines get scanned, like the image uh, looks stuttery. With the global shutter, the photo is taken all at once, so you don't have that stuttering effect. There's no um, change between, you know, there's no mo motion between the lines, but it's a lower resolution. I think it's only like, you know, one point, more like two megapixels. It's not like, you know, five or 10 or 12 megapixels. That's the trade off. But if you want global shutter, you want to take the photo all at once, uh, this camera's for you. However, one to note. It doesn't come with lenses. You'll have to pick up a See lens. these things? They don't come with it. You're going to need it. it. Yeah. See how it doesn't come with a lens? You're going to need a lens. And if we say you need a lens and we have a picture of a lens, don't say, well, there's a picture of a lens. I should have got a lens. No, you need a lens. These are what lenses look like. That's right. So you'll need the lens. It's a C or CS yeah. lens. You screw on to this, yeah. You screw on. Don't come with it. And you get the wide angle or the telephoto, and that's how yeah. you take photos of the thing, either far away or really close. Yeah. All right, next up. This is coming soon, but we are excited. It's kind of soon, but a lot of people asked us. They wanted to know um, when these would be available, so we figured we'd put them in the shop. This is the DVI output RP20. They're going to go fast. Uh, they're going to go fast, and they're very cool. So it has a, a DVI output port, also known as HDMI compatible. Yeah. It doesn't have audio, although we're kind of looking into maybe we could add Who audio. Knows? But for right now, it's DVI only, and we've got an Arduino library that we recommend people use where you have a frame buffer. Um, and this is the Adafruit GFX like demo yeah, code that cool. we've got. You know, It draws like circles and lines and squares and fonts and text. So it's a 320 by 240 internal or 400 by 240 internal frame buffer 16-bit color um you can see some color here and that's uh that's because that's how much memory the rp2040 has right the rp2040 only has uh 264k of ram so if you are using 320 by 240 that's 155k uh 400 by 240 that's 190 ish k so you know you want to have some memory left over and those are kind of standard um dvi um resolutions you know could you, there are some pico dvi projects where they like automatically on the fly generate graphics and so you can go to higher resolution but then you don't have a frame buffer you're kind of like on the fly trying to generate the uh the graphics but you know what you, know, you check it out um i'm sure you know you'll the folks here who are excited about doing dvi hacking um but what just really neat is it's all in one you get the all the feather pins um labeled you know at the top and it's like the standard feather 
GPIO as well, I squared C, eight megabytes of flash, USB C, the DVI, you know, output at the HDMI port using eight consecutive pins. You also get the hot plug detect utility and CEC pins if you'd like, and the I squared C coming from the DVI, right? That's the EDID reading code, so you can tell what monitor it's connected to. Uh, that's level shifted, and you get that on the I squared C pins as well. So um, good video hacking board that will be coming soon. Figure to let people sign up for it. Sign and, up, uh, go fast. Week or two, we'll have them in the shop. We can hopefully. go to the next one. Okay, so uh, we're getting close to the start of the show, but to get ready, uh, we're going to have a can pal. Uh, this is a board that I designed when a few years ago when we were doing some can experimentation, and then I couldn't get anything. Um, but the components are finally available and back in stock. I can't believe we couldn't even get like can bus transceivers. That's how bad it was for the last few years. But now they're plentiful. So this is a CAN bus transceiver. This is used with a microcontroller that has a CAN peripheral. The CAN peripheral is the thing that generates the bits, and the transceiver is what converts it from those bits into the differential signal required to be on a CAN bus. If your microcontroller doesn't have a CAN peripheral, you can't use this. This is only for those, again, those microcontrollers that have, if it says somewhere in the data sheet, I have CAN bus, you can use this and you connect the RX and TX pins to the two CAN pins, power it with three or uh, three to five volts, um, and it uses whatever logic level you power it with. Some chips that do have CAN peripheral, ESP32 N series, um, STM32 F405, SAM E51, some chips that don't have CAN peripheral, at Megas, SAMD21, SAMD51. RP2040, or though somebody once did a PIO hacked version, but pretty much it doesn't have a peripheral built in. NRF52 series doesn't have CAN. Um, the IMX RT1011 doesn't have CAN built in. The TNC4 does have CAN, so you would use this with the TNC4. Again, you have to have that peripheral, connect the RX and TX. Um, on this board, we also have a little boost converter on the left that'll generate the five volts required from three volts uh, power. Um, so you don't need to have a separate five volt power input. And there's a switch on it for the termination. So it's a good idea to have termination at the beginning and end of your CAN uh, line because you have like all these devices on it. Uh, if you want to add termination, flip the switch. And it says 60 ohms, but it's 60 ohms on every on each side, high and low. It's 120 ohms total. I want to clarify that because I think it might be confusing. Um, so on the other side, you get the terminal blocks with low, high, and common ground. So that's the CAN bus transceiver. If your board and my controller have CAN peripheral. Start of the show, beside it too, Lady Ada, our team, our customers, our community, everybody who makes this thing go is da 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 roll. Here it is. CAN. Okay, but let's say your microcontroller doesn't have a CAN peripheral and you want to add a CAN peripheral. That's what I want. Okay, you've come to the right place. You want to use the CAN bus wing, huh? which features the MCP2515 over SPI. The CAN 2515, it's a slightly older chip, but you know what? It's reliable, it's inexpensive, and it's available right now, which is really important. Um, so this chip is partnered with a uh, TJA 1051-T-3, sorry, TJA 1051-T-3, which is a 3-volt logic level CAN transceiver. Uh, we also have a little 5-volt boost generator to give you a uh, clean 5 volts so it can communicate on the CAN bus lines. And this basically adds a CAN peripheral to any microcontroller that um, doesn't have it built in. As I mentioned for the CAN PAL, ESP32 has CAN peripheral, TNC4 has CAN peripheral, SAM E51 does as well, and the STM32 F405. But most low cost microcontrollers do not, in which case you plug this in. It communicates over the SPI lines, plus it needs a CS pin, an interrupt pin. And boom, you have now CAN bus for any Mac controller board. So let's go to the overhead boom. and I will show you boom. what it looks like. Okay, so let me zoom. zoom exactly and focus. Okay, so this is it. I just, you know, plugged it onto, whoop, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a uh, let's see, this is a, um, SAMD21 or NRF50, sorry, it's uh, at Mega 32U4 Feather, a perfect example of a chip that does not have CAN bus, but let's say you want to send messages back and forth. You plug this in, it communicates with the MCP2515, 
there's code in like every platform has code for the uh this chip it's extremely common it's kind of like the can transceiver chip that everyone uses um and then uh it sends messages to and from this and then um over here is a terminal block you can use the uh the wires here you plug into h and l through the transceiver this is the transceiver um the can bus lines you can connect to a can bus and send and receive messages uh, very nicely up to, I think, one megabit per second speed. So very, very fast. Um, over here, if you want, you can get a DE9. Um, so like, you know, like a serial port connector and you can solder it. Um, they straddle. They can get this version. It's linked off the product page. You solder it in and then you can connect this to like an ODB port. A lot of them either have a uh, or can devices that have a DE9 um, db uh, d sub connector or you can connect it to an odb cable if you want to connect to a car um, there's onboard termination here this is like the 120 ohm and then you can cut this if you don't want to have the termination because you're adding this into an existing CAN bus line that's only terminated and then uh we also have um the reset and silent pins you know you probably don't need them but if you if you do want them and then on the back we connect the uh Chip select and interrupt pins automatically to uh, GPIO 5 and 6, but you can um, cut them and uh, reassign those pins if you like. Just solder a jumper from these pads over to uh, whatever you like. So this is, you know, any feather you want to use with CAN bus. Very common in robotics, again, automotive, um, automation. But also it's, you know, it's great because unlike I squared C, any device can send a signal at any time. So it's great for... Um, large networks where you don't want to have to have like one polling controller and multiple peripherals. Unlike UART, you can have multiple devices. There's a priority queue built in. Um, it's differential, so it's great in noisy environments. And, you know, it's it's a pretty low cost way to connect to existing devices that use CAN. Very commonly used, um, you know, in a lot of electronics and automotive robotics and such, but I think could also be used by general makers who want to connect multiple microcontrollers together using only two wires we asked can we do it we did we, we can. can that's new products